Welcome to Lecture 9. In this lecture, what I thought we'd do is take a moment to step back and have a look at what we've learned this week. Bryophytes, lycophytes, and manilophytes have a lot of complicated morphology and would probably do us some good to have a look at what they actually look like in real life. So what I did is I went to the conservatory and the sciences lab building and pulled as many examples as I could find of living plants and went through their key features. Another thing I like to do in this lecture is take you on a virtual tour of campus. I know that we're not all at UC Davis right now, but if you are on campus, there are some places that you can go and have a look at some really cool and interesting plants that we're either going to talk about or have talked about already and give you a better sense of how to connect with what you're learning in this class with what you actually see in life. Remember, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm happy to connect with you on a Zoom office hours. Now, I know everybody's been working hard and I really wish you were on campus so we could go out and have a look at the plants. But instead, what I thought I'd do is take you on a personalized plant tour of the UC Davis campus. So get ready, grab your skateboard, and let's go. All right, folks, so here we are. It was such a great day. What I thought I would do is take you on a little tour of the campus. I know some of you aren't here right now, but for those of you that are, let's go have a tour around campus and see what kind of plants we can actually see. It's Friday, the sun's shining. Let's go outside and see what's going on. Mode of transport, we're going on a skateboard. Let's go. Stop. We're coming up here to store. Looks a little sad right now, but there's some cool plants that you need to have a look at. We haven't talked about these yet. But let's stop and have a look. These are some cycads. Store Hall has some really, really great cycads that are out right in front. These are gymnosperms. We're going to talk about those next week but you can see they kind of have really amazing cones, right? So here's our cone. Check out these awesome leaves. Plants actually have separate sexes, right? There's male plants and female plants and the cones look totally different. I'll show you some, I'll show you some of those in the conservatory, but yeah, check that out. All right, next step, I think we should be able to find some more cycads. All right, so Here's some aloes. They're all flowering right now. So if you're on campus, there's a lot of cool plants that you can actually go out and have a look at. If you look closely in some of these areas, you'll see, yep, more cycads. This guy right here, definitely a big, beautiful cycad. Look at how awesome it is. No cone, I don't see any cones, but certainly really cool. All right, let's go on to some of the other cool places I know. All right, off we go. Well, 
on my right here, as we skate by, you can see there are some redwood trees. So those are gymnosperms, and we're going to talk about those next week. But there's a really special one coming up here on the right that I want to show you. You can see it from a distance right there. That's actually an oracaria. So that's a, it's called a monkey puzzle tree. And it's a gymnosperm as well. And the cones of these guys get absolutely huge. Sort of think maybe sort of small volleyball size. But you can see they have really distinctive leaves here. Oftentimes they're a little pokey, but either way, huge, beautiful aracaria tree or monkey puzzle tree. Really distinctive. I don't think a lot of people notice that on campus. Have you noticed it? All right, let's go find some more. Come on campus to escape them without some tricks. Ooh, all off the curb. All right, here we are, the Arboretum. If you've not been here before, you should definitely come and check it out. Let's hit the trail. Hey. All right, wow. Here we are, keeping our distance, having a look. Lots of amazing plants here, most of which are labeled. Really great to see. Sometimes you can see some mosses and... Sometimes you can see some mosses and things underneath some of the plants, but not always. We're in the California plant section right now. How's it going? Good, how are you? All right. There are occasionally fans. How's it going? Hey. Okay, so here's one of my favorite places in the Arboretum, and that's the Redwood Grove. And so here we're surrounded by gymnosperms. Look at these really great redwoods gives you a little bit of an idea of what it would be like to actually go and walk through some of the old growth or primary growth rapid forest that we have in our state. And so I would encourage you to get outside and have a look at those once they're reopened if you have a chance. But one tree in here is really special and that's why I brought you out here. And that is this tree, that is our dawn redwood. So believe it or not, this is the closest living relative of our coast redwood, and it's from China. And you can see it kind of has some similar leaves. They are very representative of the kind of thing that you would see in another redwood tree, but these really stand out as something quite a bit different. And so whenever you have this, we call it a disjunct distribution where you have two species but they're widely separated geographically, geographically from one another. And so you can get a pretty good idea of this really pretty tree and I'd encourage you to come and have a look if you're in Davis and you have the time. In this section we'll revisit the bryophytes. Earlier this week we talked about three different plant groups collectively referred to as the bryophytes these are the liverworts, the moss, 
in the hornworts. So these three groups are characterized by having a dominant gametophyte generation. So all of this green stuff is actually gametophyte. And the sporophyte is nutritionally dependent and attached to the gametophyte. So keep in mind that in these three groups, the life cycle really is one where that gametophyte generation is most of the plant that you see. This is very different than the plants that you would see if you went outside and didn't see one of these plants. Most of the plants you're familiar with have a sporophyte dominant life cycle. But here we have a gametophyte dominant stage. And so the sporophyte is always nutritionally dependent and attached, even though the gametophyte can live on its own. Let's have a closer look at each of these so we can have a good idea of what their differences actually are. So here we have a liverwort. Remember that liverworts have a couple of different body styles. One style is the thallus type of body style, and that's what we have here. When I actually touch this liverwort, it's pretty stiff and hard to the touch. It's not like those leafy liverworts we talked about last time. And you can see that in this case, this is, happens to be a male liverwort. What we have is an extension of gametophyte tissue that kind of looks like a little palm tree. And on these uh, extensions of gametophyte tissue underneath is where you would find the antheridia. And so the antheridia are the structures that produce sperm. So the sperm would have to swim down from this structure here and then swim onto a whole nother liverwort, again, when it's really wet or maybe when it's raining, in order to eventually get to the egg. And if you recall, on the female liverwort, which I don't have here, you have another structure that looks like this, but the sporophyte is formed as a teeny little yellow structure on the undersurface of the extension of the gametophyte. So again, this is a liverwort, this is the thallus type or thallos type of liverwort. Remember from a lecture that if you carefully pull up the liverwort on the undersurfaces, you're going to see those rhizoids. Those rhizoids are not roots, but they are extensions that will help anchor the plant and also serve to increase surface area so they can do better water absorption. All right, moving on to the mosses. Mosses are a little bit more commonly encountered than liverworts. Now, when you have a look at a moss, you can tell that it's got a really nice sort of soft feel to it. They tend to be really small, so not really as obvious as liverworts, but a lot more common. All this green tissue is gametophyte. So again, the gametophyte is dominant, and then this stringy stuff coming up here happens to be the sporophyte. And if you look closely at the tips of these extensions, you can see the sporangium, which would eventually release the spores. Now, when the sporophyte first comes up, it's actually green, so you can look and see that these are green, but very quickly they turn brown like this. And so they're capable of doing photosynthesis for a short period of time, but we still say that they are nutritionally dependent upon the gametophyte. All right, let's move on to the hornworts. Hornworts are quite a bit different than liverworts and moss. So one of the things you'll notice right here is all this stringy stuff that sort of looks like maybe blades of grass. And believe it or not, these are actually the horns. So remember, the horns and hornworts have indeterminate growth. So these will keep on growing as long as they can. Um, without, of course, vascular tissue, they can only get so high. And then the actual main part of the liverwort body is that dark green sort of gelatinous looking stuff at the very bottom. Now the hornworts that we have here in Sciences Lab building have to be kept both cold and very wet in order to stay alive. So 
among the different bryophytes, hornworts are really sensitive in terms of moisture. Remember, they also oftentimes have a blue-green blue coloration, which indicates that they have a symbiosis with cyanobacteria. Some of the other bryophytes also have a symbiosis with, symbi uh, with cyanobacteria, but the hornworts in particular are really known for it, and that's what gives them that really interesting um, look to their um, body. So these are the bryophytes. Remember liverworts, moss, and hornworts. They're all characterized by having a gametophyte dominant generation. They don't have any vascular tissue. If you look online, you might see that some groups mention structures called hydroids and leptoids, which are a little bit similar to vascular tissue, but we don't consider it to be the same thing as xylem and phloem at all. They distribute nutrients and water inside their cells by diffusion. So despite the fact that some water might be picked up by rhizoids, the nutrients in the water and the sugars all get around inside the plant because of diffusion. Again, these guys tend to be kind of like the amphibians of the plant world. They tend to be closely tied to water, mostly because they're reliant on it for reproduction. Let's stop here and then move on to the lycophytes. In this section, we'll revisit the lycophytes. Moving on from the bryophytes, you can actually have a look now at the lycophytes. And I have two examples of lycophytes here for you today. I have selaginella, which kind of looks like a fern, but is definitely very different. And then of course I have lycopodium, which kind of looks like a giant furry pipe cleaner. So again, both of these plants are in the same group, even though they look really different from one another. I unfortunately don't have an example of a quill wart to show you, but given that they're aquatic plants, you wouldn't see them unless you sort of had a look underwater or just at the surface of the water. So a couple of important details about lycophytes that we should mention are number one, this is the first group where we see the evolution of vascular tissue. So these plants have both xylem and phloem, and one consequence of this is that they're much larger. Remember that coupled with the evolution of vascular tissue is this idea of sporophyte dominance. So now the, the plant that we're looking at is not a gametophyte. In fact, it's the sporophyte. And that's what we're gonna see in all of the other plant groups that we talk about. They're sporophyte dominant. Now, also remember that lycophytes um, are characterized in part by having clusters of stacked sporangia which we call stroboli or cones. But I don't want you to get the idea that the cones on these plants are somehow really big like a pine cone. In fact, they're really small and indistinct. Unfortunately, I don't see any cones present on either of these plants right now. The last really important thing to note is that these plants are characterized by having a uh, extension of photosynthetic tissue with a single vein of vascular tissue called a microfill. So this furry stuff that I'm feeling here is actually a clusters of microfills. On the right here, you can see selaginella, and the microfills are far less distinct, but they're definitely there. So you have sort of a big hunk of stem tissue, and then branching off of that, is a bunch of small, really, really, really small microfills that you can um, just make out. Lastly, remember that selaginella is one of those plants where you get the independent evolution of heterospory. So selaginella has two sizes of spores, megaspores and microspores, while something like lycopodium only has one size of spores just like the bryophytes. So this is important because it gives selaginella a little bit of an advantage because the smaller spores can really be dispersed a lot further. And one important detail that you'll notice is that all of the plants that we talk about um, in the seed plants are all heterosporous. So all seed plants have heterospory. You still see some homospory in manilophytes, but 
This is the first time where you get the evolution of heterospory, and that's important because it puts into context seed plants. All right, so let's end with lycophytes and move on to the manilophytes. In this section, we'll revisit the manilophytes. So manilophytes are the last group that we're going to talk about. And if you think back to lecture, there are actually three groups in manilophytes. There are the leptosporangiate ferns, which are the ones that you're most familiar with. There's equisetum. This is an equisetum cutting that I made. And then there are the whisk ferns, or silotum. And here are the whisk ferns, or silotum. So let's start out with what we're most familiar with, and that tends to be the leptosporangiate ferns. And so one thing that you would immediately notice is that leptosporangiate ferns, uh, many of the species have a very characteristic leaf shape. So they have a main piece of stem with leaflets coming off of it. Remember, this is called pennate. Sometimes the pennate structure can be a little bit more complicated. So here's an example where you have lots of little leaflets branching out into lots of little, more little leaflets. Um, but either way, you get the idea. The pennate structure is something that's characteristic of a lot of leptosporangiate ferns. Not all of them, but a, a lot of them. You can even have a look at that in this sword fern. Here's yet another example where you can see that pennate structure. Now, along with that pennate structure, on the undersurfaces, you have those characteristic small clusters of sporangia called sori. And if you look closely at the undersurface of this leaf, you can see little orange dots, and those orange dots are sori. If you look closely at the undersurfaces of this leaf, you see a bunch of little pox on the undersurface. Again, those are sori as well. This one definitely has a lot of sori. In something like this other fern, what you see are really, really, really small, sort of very fine white powdery-like structures. And those are a combination of spores, but also some sori as well. So with leptosporangiate ferns, you have that characteristic leaf structure. You have the sori. If you recall from lecture, they also have that piece of underground stem tissue called a rhizome, where all the meristems are. So the bulk of the stem tissue for these ferns is oftentimes underground. Now the last thing I'll mention is that they also have a very characteristic way of leaf development. And that you can see here. If you remember, this is called a fiddlehead. So believe it or not, this will slowly unfurl and eventually become a big leaf that looks like this. It's just that all the cells are compact in there, and that's, this is actually the structure that some people oftentimes eat, although remember I recommended that that can be a little dangerous because ferns can be super toxic. Either way, you get an idea of the different leptosporangiate ferns. So moving on from that, let's talk about equisetum. I made a cutting of equisetum here. One of the things that you would notice if you felt it is that it's kind of a, got an abrasive feeling to it, and that abrasiveness is actually deposits of silica. Native Americans used to use equisetum to actually scrub things clean. And of course, if I take a clip, you'll notice that equisetum is actually hollow. So we have a hollow stem. We have really um, small, dark structures at the nodes, which are the reductions of leaves. And then we have some extensions of stem tissue here. A lot of people get confused and they think that these are leaves. That's actually not quite true. These are extensions of stem tissue. And the remnants of the leaves are little dark structures that are really hard to see unless you are zoomed in very, very close. Now eventually, at the very tip of this, you're going to end up with a strobilus or a cone, which is actually really distinctive in contrast to the lycophytes. 
I oftentimes find equisetum, especially along the banks of the Sacramento, Sacramento and American rivers. So they're adapted to live in riparian areas or areas with flowing water, which partly explains their hollow stem. It makes them a little able to withstand that. Now the last group we'll talk about are Silotum or the whisk ferns. And you can see they look very different than any of the groups we've talked about so far. Um, they're actually pretty tough feeling, and so they're not delicate like some of the ferns I've shown you. Um, they have a really interesting branching that I could actually make a little quick cut here and show you where you can see that uh, it starts out with one piece of stem and then splits into two, and then that one splits into two. We call that branching dichotomous. So it has dichotomous branching. And if you look, you can see these little green balls at the nodes. And those are sporangia that will eventually turn yellow when they're producing spores. One thing you should also notice is that there really are no visible leaves here. What you have are really small nubbins of leaves. Again, a lot of botanists call these microfills, even though Usually, we only talk about microfills in the context of lycophytes. So these are reductions of a typical megafill that you would say find on a leptosporangiate fern. Things I can't show you, but which Silotum has, um, are definitely a reduced root structure. So um, Silotum are often actually epiphytes. They live up in forest canopies on other um, plants. And so that partly explains why they have that reduction in roots. OK, so that's the Manila fights. I hope that was helpful. And let's wrap it up. In this lecture, we reviewed bryophytes, lycophytes, and Manila fights. In addition to their key morphology and structural details, I'd like you to think about some key concepts. One really important shift that we have to talk about is the shift from a gametophyte dominant plant to a sporophyte dominant plant. It makes good sense that this happened, especially in the context of the evolution of vascular tissue, because it allowed for greater dispersal of spores. Remember that all the plants we've talked about so far still have that limitation on their life cycle, which is sperm have to swim through water in order to reach the egg. In the next plant groups, the seed plants, they have a different way of approaching that problem. They've effectively solved it through the invention of pollen. Remember, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm happy to help you and, and connect with you in a Zoom office hours. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.